The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. In the afternoon hours of October 16th, 2017, in Bidia, Malta, the car of investigative reporter Daphne Karuna Galicia was ripped apart by a powerful bomb. My mother had to go to the bank. She left the house and then I heard the explosion, said her son Matthew, in an interview for the Allard Prize for International Integrity. His mother was a fearless Maltese journalist who was assassinated for ceaselessly uncovering corruption in her country. Her car was found more than a city block from the ignition point of the blast. It was a powerful message to anyone who dared to expose corruption at the highest level in Malta. In recent news, one of the men accused of the bombing has confessed and said had he known who she was, he would have asked for more money to kill her. That according to The Guardian. George D. Giorgio said, if I knew, I would have gone for 10 million, not 150,000 euros. He went on to say, for me, it was just business. Of course, I feel sorry. Why was Daphne feared so much? Well, it's because of her relentless focus on corruption. When the Panama Papers were released, she traced millions of dollars back to the powerful elite in Malta. Despite increasing intimidation and threats, she dug into the details of the money and those behind it. Her blog was extremely popular and had subscription rates that eclipsed the major media outlets in the country. Her son Matthew says, journalists in Malta were expected to cover up for powerful people to partake in the culture of silence and his mother refused to do that. That put her in an ultra minority. Fellow Maltese blogger, blogger Manuel Delia says when political parties are threatened by a journalist they will isolate them, dehumanize them, and in the case of Daphne they will demonize her. In an interview Daphne said they have made me into what is in effect a national scapegoat. Daphne Karuna Galicia is the posthumous co-winner of the Peter A. Allard Prize for International Integrity, which was awarded in Vancouver on October 21st, 2020. I invited her son Matthew to join us for a conversation that matters about the unveiling of corruption and the high price Daphne paid for her brave pursuit of the truth. But before we go to that interview, here is the video that tells the story of Daphne to the Allard Prize. Journalists here were expected to sort of cover up for powerful people, to partake in the culture of silence, and my mother refused to do that. This really put her in a sort of ultra minority. For decades, she was the number one voice that encapsulated the success of a woman going against everything. She had hundreds of thousands of readers. She just blew the newspapers out of the water. When political parties are threatened by a journalist, they will isolate them, they will dehumanize them. In the case of Daphne, they will demonize them. They have made me into what in effect is a national scapegoat. And this has gone on for 30 years. Political parties here perversely own television stations. Therefore, most people get their information from political parties. People have no idea of how she was targeted so viciously. I got used to it, you know, like a scarf always around the world. But my biggest concern is that because people see what happened to me, they don't want to do it. She had so many sources and so much information was coming to her. She couldn't handle it on her own. She was the source of so much information that was about to bring the reputation of our country down in tatters. When the Panama Papers broke, 
most journalists in Malta took it at face value. These politicians have offshore companies, it's unethical, that's it, case closed. We had people in a position of power who were trying to set up dodgy structures in order to funnel money away from jurisdictions that would have otherwise traced them. What Daphne did is she exposed them. She didn't stop working on that investigation even after the subject had changed. In denouncing this, Daphne was perceived as a threat to the easy money that many people were benefiting from. Nothing was normal around that time. We were in this kind of emergency situation already. All these sort of forces were working together against my mom. I was working full time on the Paradise Papers investigation. And we had sort of settled down for the day at this big table that we shared as a desk. My mother had to go to the bank. She left the house. And then I heard the explosion. Ever since then, everything changed completely. Within the first hour of her death, they had started putting up an incredible fight to defend her work. Suddenly, we had to transform ourselves into a kind of advocacy organization. Before that, we were just people trying to, you know, live our lives. Today I am reminded that no matter what happened to Daphne, no matter how hard certain forces will work to suppress or distort her work, even in death, she lives on. Daphne lives on in my three sons, who have so much of her strength and integrity. She lives on in the people who choose to protect her legacy. The immediate reaction we had was, to make sure this doesn't fade away. This is why it's been so important to us, even on a personal level, that, you know, civil society movement emerged, because imagine doing all that on our own. Change, societal, cultural, political, far-reaching and meaningful change requires a critical mass of people who are prepared to actively participate in the shaping of their own future, that of their children and this country. Simply agreeing is not enough. We must do. Because if not us, then who? This was more than a year after the Panama Papers. All that evidence of corruption had been published and nothing happened. And this investigation into money laundering and corruption ultimately led to her murder. Whoever wanted to kill Daphne didn't only want to achieve her death. They also wanted to achieve the end of her investigations. They also wanted to secure their own impunity. It's only by force that there is going to be any investigative work done. Justice for Daphne is not just about jailing her murderers. It's about justice for her stories, which is that all the people she exposed, they have to face justice too. It is very important that they stay exposed because Daphne, unfortunately, was very well known in Malta, but she only became a big star of the anti-corruption movement internationally when it was too late for her. People in power, at best, stood by while she was killed. At worst, helped in getting her killed. There are many powerful, violent, dangerous, corrupt people who are fighting back against us. If there's more impunity, our lives are going to continue to be in danger. So for me, it's, it's really a question of life and death, as it was for my mother.
The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Matthew, welcome. In a divided Malta, how polarizing was your mother's work? I didn't see it as polarizing because it was simply my mother <laughs> against almost everyone else. That's how it that's how it was really, which is not polarizing. It's like David and Goliath. Um and I think that that's how it was right up until the end too. Um because my mom started doing her work in a very conservative male dominated environment. Um, she was not just the only woman doing that work, but the only person. And um, this really put her in a sort of ultra minority. And it's work that would have been normal in any other country. It would have been normal in Canada, in the UK, in Germany, wherever. It was just in Malta that it was um, unheard of that a journalist would be doing this kind of work. Um, journalists here were expected to sort of cover up for powerful people, to partake in the culture of silence, and my mother refused to do that. What was the deciding factor for her to set up her blog? I think the primary motivation for it was around the time of the general election 2008. Um, my mom had a bi-weekly column at the time, Facebook or Twitter wasn't really uh, a thing. I mean, Facebook existed, but it just wasn't popular here. And um, there were a few blogs, like maybe two or three, that, ha that were becoming quite popular among, let's call them, newsmakers, sort of, or opinion makers. And my mother felt restrained by her bi-weekly column. Um, she wanted something that gave her like more direct and and um, sort of on-demand communication with her audience. And she had asked me like, what do you think about setting up a blog or should I set up a blog? And at first I thought it was like, you know, at first I thought that she shouldn't because I thought it was like the, a very, only a very tiny um, proportion of Malta's population followed blogs. I just thought it wouldn't, wasn't worth the effort. But I had underestimated <laughs> my mother's effect like on, on, on the medium. Um, so then eventually I said, okay, fine, like let's set up a blog. And I set it up for her. And as soon as she started publishing this blog, suddenly she had tens of thousands of readers. These, these other blogs like that existed before hers had maybe 3,000, 4,000 readers per month. My mouse had not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands. It was just um, something that I never expected. And uh, she would like publish a blog post around the time of the elections and 300 comments, 400 comments. So was like that immediately. She just like blew the newspapers out of the water. And that, that changed everything. It, it absolutely changed everything. It also like really marked her out as an enemy um, to, to political parties because suddenly they lost control of the, of the conversation. They lost control of the public discourse. From what I understand, the investigative work that she was reporting on was not being covered by major media sources. But they were more than happy that she was willing to do that work. And they were also happy to piggyback off of it. So it became the situation where other media organizations were depending on my mother. The police were depending on my mother. The tax authorities depending on my mother. Financial investigators depending on my mother. It just became... Like, all the weight was on her. Why did she continue reporting when she had all of these pressures, knowing there were nefarious and dangerous people that she was exposing? She just kept going, but she kept going, like, knowing that if she stopped, um, 
the bad guys would win, let's say, because no one else would sort of step in to, to fill her shoes. Um, my mom, like most people, just wanted to, you know, make have her own life and like enjoy it and not have to deal with um, all of the problems caused by um, battling against like really powerful corrupt people. But she had this enormous sense of duty and um, I guess she sort of stepped up to it, that responsibility. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Based on the nature of her work and who she was reporting on, she knew that she was exposing dishonest people and she knew that there was going to be opposition. How horrible was it for her and for your family? It was awful because the thing was, the, re the reaction wasn't like um, what you're saying is untrue or you're not credible or whatever. It is, the, re the reaction was, um, we're the bad guys. <laughs> um, but like you're choosing to mess with us and you're going to suffer the consequences. You're going to be made to pay for it. And in fact, after my mother was murdered, the sort of explanation given by supporters of the ruling party was she decided to mess with dangerous people and these are the consequences. Like, it's not our fault. Um, and that's obviously wrong. I mean, that's not how things should be. This all ultimately leads to October 16th, 2017. Tell me about that day. It was, it was just like a normal, well, normal. I mean, nothing was normal around that time. We were in this kind of emergency situation already. Things were really bad. Um, all these sort of forces were like working together against my mom. Um, I was working full time on the Paradise Papers investigation and we had sort of settled down for the day at this big table that we shared as a desk. Um, my mother had to go to the bank and that was the, basically the last thing that happened. She, she left the house and then I heard the explosion and that was, that was it. I mean, ever since then. Obviously, everything changed completely. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Just hours after your mother's murder, you and your family came together and fought for and demanded an investigation. Why is it important that you pressed for a full investigation? Yes, we realized that straight away. I mean, first of all, this was a year, more than a year after the Panama Papers. All that evidence of corruption had been published and nothing happened. And so automatically, my attitude was, nothing is going to happen with the murder investigation either. It's only by force that there is going to be any investigative work done. And so we knew that we had to create as much pressure as possible for the investigation to be done properly. Do we know who all of the people are that were involved in your mother's murder? Jürgen Fenech, who is one of the people involved in this money laundering scheme, um, who promised to pass on money to the shell companies owned by officials. This is a bribe. Um, is the person charged with the murder? And we do believe that, yes, he is the person who commissioned my mother's murder. There are other people around him that also need to be charged, that participated in the kickback scheme um, that ultimately led to my mother's murder. Up to the point of her murder, there were 54 libel cases against your mother. It's totally obscene. 
and some of them were even criminal libel cases. So the objective was actually to send my mother to jail. Are those libel cases still active? Yes, so the majority of them are. Mm -hmm. There are, I think, 30 left. It's just insane that under Malta's system, the family of... We inherit them. So if we've inherited all of the civil libel cases that have been filed against my mother. There were 46 in total civil cases. We inherited every single one of those. Some were dropped, others we won. There are now 30 left. And most of them were filed by officials. And how is the case progressing? Not well. I mean, the, the work we're doing is important and we're making progress and really there's no other choice for us. But it's, it's, not, it's not easy and um, there are many powerful, violent, dangerous, corrupt people who are fighting back against us. So again, we're in the same situation that my mother was in, the sort of David and Goliath type situation. What happens now? Are you continuing your mother's work? Yes, we do this every day. I mean, it's the journalistic work, the work on investigating the murder, or making sure there's justice for the murder, and also making sure there's justice for my mom's journalism, so that the corruption that she reported on leads to prosecutions. Why is it important that you continue her work? Because if we don't continue the work, I mean, there's just going to be more impunity, and if there's more impunity, our lives are going to continue to be in danger. So, for me, it's, it's really a question of life and death, as it was for my mother. Is it encouraging for you to know that international media are now starting to take notice of what is happening in Malta? Yes, it is, definitely. It is. Again, corrupt people often depend on the sort of cover of darkness. So the more light we shine on what's happening here, the better. Matthew, thank you for your time. More importantly, thank you for staying committed to the truth. <laughs>